Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. Today, Ty and I are going to be discussing Season 1, Episode 5. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. Yeah, Episode 5, Back to the Butcher. Uh, I think this one is Rob Lieberman and Dan Nowak. Uh, Dan, who's been, uh, who's the only writer who's, other than than Daniel and I, who's been on the show since uh, the very first season and still writing episodes now for Season 6. Oh, Danny Nowak on the attack, getting it done with season five, episode five, season one. I like it. So he's he's an OG. He's been around from the. He's been since the beginning. Yeah, and and it's funny because, um, in the first season he was a producer. Um, he had just come off of a show called The Killing. I don't know if you if you know The Killing. I do. Um, he actually started his career with The Killing. He was a writer's assistant on The Killing. And got his first script on that show, got his first staff writing job on that show. And he had come over to us and he came in as a, as a producer, just that producer level. And Daniel and I were on the show. Uh, we also had a producer title because it was in our contract uh, that we were producers for life of the show. So that was like sort of the basic title they gave us was just regular producer. Uh-huh. Starting in season two, we became writing producers on the show. And so Dan Nowak and Daniel and I, our, our titles and responsibilities on the show have gone up at the same level through the entire show. So by, <laughs> so, by, yeah, by season four, I think all of us were executive producers and yeah, we've been executive producers. So you were unable to fire him and he was unable to fire you or you guys might not have made it through the end. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Danny Nowak's a good friend of ours. You know what's funny about uh, Dan Nowak is that, uh, you know, like you said, he's been on the first, second but he's not like he, he kind of, it takes a little bit to warm up. And then once you once you get to know him, like once you have a few drinks with him and hang out with him, he's so funny, so smart. I love hanging around him. We're gonna have him on the show. We're gonna talk about trimmers. Such a good time. Yeah. And uh I we had him on the uh the season five podcast, and I was so excited because he cracks me up. I think he's you know really funny, really smart. I had him on. But in the beginning, he gets a little shy. He gets a little cold feet. And I'm like, Dan, come on. But, you know, he, he gets a little cold feet when he's in, uh, gets a little shy in those situations. Yeah, you got you to gotta warm him up a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Generally, uh, unless, you know, you've gone to a, a bar with him once and had a couple of beers with him, he, he's, he's, he can be a little, uh, a little shy. Yeah. But can we talk a little bit about how dark the Butcher Vanderson Station story is? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. I was like, Jesus yeah. Christ. And then to to really just twist it in, you have the guy floating through space with his little girl and they're like frozen together. Yeah, that, that is that is pretty dark. Uh so that um that sequence, that's one of the things we do on the show is we'll take uh short stories or novellas that Daniel and I have written and we'll find ways to stick them in the show. And we wrote a we wrote a short story called uh, "The Butcher of Anderson Station" about Fred when he was you know when he was still a colonel with the the Marines, and uh, the incident that set him off to become a freedom fighter in the belt. And it is that story. It's the story of the people on the station, and and Fred comes there to to uh, put down a, an insurrection and winds up killing a bunch of of innocent people in the process. And uh, so yeah, so. Uh, Narain gave Dan the uh, the assignment to take that story and weave it into the season five script, and I think he did a nice job with it. I mean, it's, so, it's not the same as the story it, that we wrote at all, but the events are are similar, and the and the emotional payoff is is exactly the same. It's great. And so, what is the story? You have a, a Belter uh, group that's working under low oxygen conditions, yeah. uh, and they start a, a rebellion. And and in the beginning, the, the the girl playing the game, the little girl playing the game, was like to demonstrate that the the mental uh, abilities being hampered by the lack yeah. of oxygen. Yeah, it's it's the the story is that you have a bunch of belters on a mining station that um, are are basically protesting what they feel are dangerous working conditions, and um, they in the process of that protest, depending on who who you, you ask the question of. They accidentally or on or deliberately kill the the uh, the manager of the station, and so the the U it's a UN station, uh, so they send in the Marines to put down this what they what they're calling an insurrection. And uh, at one point in the story, Fred is confronted with the 
the fact that these these uh, these people who are, are rebelling supposedly have a, a way that they could kill a lot of Marines who are trying to enter the station. And he's trying to make a decision about whether or not he should use heavy weapons to displace these insurrectionists and protect his Marines. And in the end, he does make that decision. He makes the decision, I'm not going to risk the lives of my Marines. So he, he kills a bunch of people. And only finds out later that it was hidden from him that the the these insurrectionists had been reaching out to the UN spokesperson, the the negotiator, and offering to surrender. And that fact was deliberately hidden from him because the outcome the UN the the brass wanted is they wanted the station destroyed. They wanted all the insurrectionists killed because they were trying to set an example. They didn't want this to end peacefully. And so Fred finds out he was lied to. Um, in order to get him to make that decision and it feels so betrayed by that that he winds up uh, leaving the, the Marines and uh, joining up with the OPA to help them in their their fight for independence. And how does he become the uh, how does he come so high up in Tycho Station right away? And how do they they I mean, because a part of the story is the Belter trusting him or not trusting him. Can you trust him? What kind of person is he? But yeah. How did he get, what is he, the director of Tycho Station? Yeah, director of operations at Tycho. Well, so that uh, that's an interesting question because uh, at least in the story and the way we've played it in, in the show as well is that he gets recruited by Anderson Dawes. Um, that's that's who sort of recruits him, who, who brings him on board and uh, sort of folds him into the OPA organization. So he he starts out with the credibility of Dawes is, is vouching for him. And then Tyco is an is an Earth owned corporation. So you have a corporation that is staffed entirely by Belters, like uh, like Tyco Station is, but is owned by an Earther. And so Fred feels like a good compromise. Fred is a guy who's got a lot of high level management experience. He was a colonel in the Marines, so I mean he's obviously got a ton of of people management experience. Um, and he was born on Earth. He's technically an Earth citizen. But he works for Dawes, who is one of the heads of the OPA. So if you're looking for a sort of compromise person to run this Belter Earth-owned station, he seems like he seems like the right guy for that. That's really smart. So, but what was that first step? So he he finds out the then he withdraws from the the UN Marines. Yeah. And then Anderson Dawes finds him, reaches out to him, and then what does he what does he do at first with Anderson Dawes? Well, we we don't we never we never dramatize that part of the story. Okay. Um, so just with the last guys are right now, what happened in the, <laughs> the, the last, know, really, the last Johnson. Being recruited. <laughs> and then the next time we see him, he's, he's running Tycho. So I don't know what the, all the stuff, but there's years in between those two events. Right. So, you know, I'm, I don't know what all happens in those years, but I want to, I want to see the lost years with the Anderson Dawes and Fred Johnson <laughs> <laughs> and what their relationship was like in the early days in the wild oh, west what? days. Uh, here's here's a l- nice little Easter egg for everybody because we talked about we're going to do some Easter eggs in this. In the story, Butcher of Anderson Station, when Dawes captures Fred, he has Fred in an airlock with a gun pointed to his head and says, you know, one of two things is going to happen in this room, right? And they have a conversation. The person who's holding the gun to his head is a, is a woman who's sort of like seems like she's Dawes right hand person. She's the one with the gun to his head. Um, Kara G came to me when we were, when she got hired to be on the show and she said, do you think that woman could be drummer? And I was like, yeah, of course it could be drummer. Drummer used to work for Dawes. Uh, They, you know, they have that conversation about when she was on series, she worked for Dawes. And so drummer's sort of secret backstory for, I mean, Kara's secret backstory for drummer is she was that woman in the airlock with the gun pointed to Fred's head during that conversation. And that was the beginning of Fred and uh, drummer's relationship. I like it. I, I like thought that thought was brilliant. I was like, that's brilliant. And, and like, you know, the, the subtext, the underneath level of their, you know, whether they knew it or not, that makes perfect sense. It fits yeah. in, ex- you know, it's, it, yeah, I like that. So, uh, when we do, we'll, we'll just have to throw in a random flashback of that scene. <laughs> right. Um, Okay, so we pick up and uh, and listen, 
I don't always want to just praise the show and talk about how wonderful it is. I do want to point out some things that, that bother me a little bit, all right? And so we can air them out right here. But uh, so I think we've already discussed uh, how I felt about uh, Jay Hernandez, the new, the new Magnum, uh, gets shot through the heart like Bon Jovi. And he gets shot through the heart on the wall and he's impaled there. And then the next day they find him in a, in a pile of trash and he's still alive. Okay. So we, we talked about that. We got and it I out. I told you how that's based on a real thing that happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you talked me out of it and then I'm like, oh, wow, we are. But then we go to the beginning of uh, episode five and we see Jay Hernandez um, sitting on the hospital bed and then we get a shot at the wound and I'm like, Oh, we get a shot at the wound. Let's see what's happening here. And it looks like if you've ever played paintball, it looks like you got somebody shot him in the chest. That was a little bit too close with the paintball and, uh, way too mobile and, uh, getting around to just been impaled by a metal pole on the wall. It's future space medicine, man. It's got that glowy blue thing. <laughs> A glowy blue. Was, they were putting the glowy blue thing on when Miller walked in. They, when he walked in, they were putting it on, changing the bandage. And and uh, he and, had the glowy blue thing. <laughs> and 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 no ribs are broken. No, it just it went exactly between the ribs. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> you, you know, know when you talk about this stuff, you know, all I hear, all I hear is your seething jealousy for the fact that he gets to be Magna PI and you don't. That's all I hear. That's I just it's it's it's. But I but love I him. love I love Jay Hernandez and I love his point. That has nothing to do with him. This has everything to do with other people, not not yeah. Jay Hernandez. And so, uh, but there might be some subconscious, you know, Magnum <laughs> PI envy going on. I just you know I didn't know that they were looking for me anyway. So um, <laughs> so now we see. Oh, you know what? It's really interesting now that i you know we we did the season five after show the season five finale was a few days away it's really interesting to go back now knowing the story of marco and the rocks and all the seeds that in layers that you guys planted for instance when miller is riding on the subway and uh, is that what they're called subways we'll call it like the british do we'll call it the, the tubes, tubes. The yeah. tube. uh, he's riding on the tubes and uh he overhears the rumor starting amongst the belters that it was the OPA that took out the Doniger yeah. and that they got their own warships now. And it's just a matter of time that, that things are going to start turning around. And what's interesting is, you know, when you first watch whatever, those things just, you know, if you don't know the overall story and it's like, wow, the, the layers that they're weaving in and the foreshadowing of what's going to happen or what's going to come. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought that was, uh, that was a really interesting moment. And there's a few more in this that, that we'll get to uh, as we go for, further. So Captain Shadid and them, they're in the police precinct and they're seeing videos of Havelock, Magnum PI, the new Magnum PI, getting impaled on the wall by the guy that they think is OPA. Yeah. Um, and then everybody goes on this manhunt. They're going to find this guy that's one of their own. She's like, if he, if he falls out of fucking airlock, who cares? We're, you know, we're going to get this guy. Um, and you would think that Miller, because this is his partner and also how we've established the, his vigilante justice and how he handles things, that he would be on the ball. But he is now getting consumed by the case of Julie Mao. Yeah. And what I think is a really, get, really good writing and really good performance uh, adjustment uh, for, for Miller is when Miller's wife comes to his apartment to see what he's doing and he's on the case and he demonstrates to her the Anubis and that the Anubis was on, on the way somewhere. Or I the, mean, it's not his wife. Oh, his ex-wife. Well, his, his ex-partner, and we definitely, we definitely imply that they had a romantic relationship as well. But uh, I don't think we ever oh, really the, say that I she thought was, it was his ex-wife the whole time. I thought it was his ex-wife. Uh, I mean, you could, certainly, you could certainly make that guess. I don't think we ever say that. But sure, I mean, they had some kind of romantic relationship, whatever. I think it was his wife. I think I'm gonna, we need to talk to the writers. Okay. Figure out. <laughs> I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay, his ex partner, and they might have had relations. Um, <laughs> so he's going through, and he sees that the Anubis, Anubis, 
and he even he and, and also that, that was a quick uh quick detail uh, I'm curious about. Was he having a hard time getting the the ship name right and y'all wrote it in where he in the beginning where he was he didn't really know if it was the Anubis or the Anubis? Yeah, uh, so when we put it in the when we put it in the script, everyone had that problem. Like everybody in the writer's room was pronouncing it wrong. So we just we started putting that in all the scripts so that everybody who tries to say it says it wrong. So yeah, that was that was the beginning of that for sure. Because that's that's that is also a little trick, you know. If you go in and you, you're having a hard time with something, you just put it in there. It's like, is it the anabus? Right? And then once you address it, then you can do it, and you know, yeah. it doesn't matter. Yeah. But what I think is interesting about this is you see him turn on, him be engaged in a way that we haven't seen yet, and you see this fascination with the case, and then him, you know, uh, figuring these things out and putting these pieces together. The Anun the Anunibus is leaving Phoebe, <laughs> <laughs> the Nunabetus. Uh, <laughs> uh, was leaving Phoebe and it was headed to Eros and uh, Julie Mao's ship, he believes, was going to intercept intercept that ship. So there was something on the Eblinubitus that is important. And so he, you see the energy and the excitement and being turned on by it, but his maybe wife, maybe partner... Somebody he's had a relationship. No, I'm just kidding. But his, his old partner says to, you know, he she says to him, look, this is seems really big and interesting. Maybe you need to kick it up the chain of command. Then you see him deflated. And then you see the that motivating uh, insecurity in his job in the sense of like, you, you don't think I can solve this. You don't think that I'm capable of doing this. And you and I had a talk about, uh, you know, the like the Denzel Washington movie, The Last Man Standing, where they hired this guy deliberately because they didn't think that he was going to do his job. Yeah. And so this is the first step of, of Miller really, you know, understanding that they don't think that he's capable of figuring this out. Yeah. And, and if you think about what Miller has been doing for the last few years, you know, I, being a cop on series, at one point he even says there's, there's no laws on series. There's just cops. Being a cop on series is, is almost like being, you know, a, a street enforcer for the corporations, right? Uh, you're not there to, you're, you're there to keep belters from getting too uppity, but you're not there to, to solve crimes. And, you know, he, ta you know, he takes bribes. He's, he's, he's as corrupt as they come. And if, if you think about a guy who probably went into this and found something he liked about being a cop, they probably, you know, because when we see him dig his teeth into that mystery, you see a guy who liked solving mysteries, who liked figuring it out and has been beaten down by the job for years now and has sort of given up on that piece of himself and now he's got a real mystery a real real locked locked room who done it kind of mystery and it's bringing that excitement back like this is the part of the job i loved i figuring something like this out is really interesting and and this character of julie mao is interesting and what happened to this ship is interesting and he's really getting into it and it's kind of bringing that old excitement back and then Octavia comes in, you know, his former partner, and is basically like, no, you need to go back to being what you were before. You need to go back to being a drunk and a loser and a guy who takes bribes and just pushes the, you know, kicks the can down, down the road instead of actually getting anything done. And yeah, you're 100% right. You see on his face how deflating that is. You know, she just sucks all the excitement out of it, all the energy out of it going, no, this is too big for you. You're not good enough for this. Give it to somebody else. Yeah, it's it, and it's beautifully played by by Tom. Yeah, so what I think is, uh, yeah, Thomas Jane did such a good job because you see his spirit become revived and then you get a sense of like, oh, this guy was once a good cop and yeah. he's been bogged down by the bureaucracy, by the streets, by it, all of these things. And uh, and he's kind of, he's lost that zest. that And, and that's, what, that, that's a lot of great noirs, like that protagonist when they come up and they're beaten down. And then they find that one thing that gets that spark and you see the talent and, yeah. and what made them what they are. So Miller, he goes to eat and then he's, uh, as he's eating, he's eating noodles that I love the Blade Runner, you know, they're always eating noodles and, you know, it has that, you know, Blade Runner throwback and everything is, do you guys model that? The no, let, 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 let me tell you a quick story about that. Um, Cause we actually got in trouble for that. So the reason we went to pick that restaurant is because it had a beautiful look to it. Like that there was that there's a really interesting texture on the wall at the mm -hmm. back. 
Uh-huh. And and Jeremy shone a, a blue light down that wall, and it just created this really fascinating sort of metallic blue texturing on the wall. So everybody was in love with that. And we also liked how skinny the restaurant was, that it was like it was you know it was very compact, and it felt like a place you would see on series. That's why we picked it. Now it also happens to be a noodle restaurant, and so they were like, you know, we can have guys in here making noodles if you want. If you and the director was was very excited by that. It was like, yeah, we definitely want that. You get steam, you get all this cool atmosphere. Uh, so Andrew Kosov, do you you, you know Andrew Kosov? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Who was uh, one of the presidents of Alcon, uh, our production company, specifically said, when we see Miller eating, do not have him eating noodles because, of course. We, we didn't know this, but Alcon was in the middle of making a Blade Runner movie at the time. They were making <laughs> Blade Runner, the, the Blade Runner sequel. And Andrew was really worried that that the show would wind up kind of stepping on that Blade Runner territory while they're also making a Blade Runner movie. And he specifically told the production, I don't want to see him eating noodles. Somehow that did not get to the street level of the production. So we wound up shooting the scene they had the guys in there making noodles. They had Thomas eating noodles. Uh, that was a problem. We got in trouble for that. Andrew was not happy about that. So, but, so it looks great in the scene, and I think the scene turned out really well. But yeah, we, we did get in a little trouble for that one. <laughs> I have a feeling you guys might have got the note and you just ignored it. No, like, no. We little naughty boys. We did I, not. I no, Trust Ty, me, no I, one I, on I, our I show ignored the truth, truth, and you might not have your job going back to season six. <laughs> I'm putting it out here right now. Oh man, it was great working with you. But I think that, uh, but but the thing is, is you know, this is tech noir, and Blade Runner is one of the greatest tech noirs of all time, and it's an homage to that. It's a throwback yeah. to that. So you know, I, I think well, you, I'm just I'm just saying that that's a fun little uh, nugget. That is a fun little nugget that that's why Ty got fired for season yeah, six. <laughs> that he was funny. bragging about it on a podcast. <laughs> Sorry, Andrew. I had nothing to do with that shit. I, you know, I didn't have any. <laughs> well, my, my only excuse is uh, that first season I was hanging around, but I had absolutely no power. Oh, so okay. I'm protected by my complete power. <laughs> and then I always light up when the great Jared Harris comes up to the bar Thomas Jane uh, is, you know, doing his investigation on the thing. And, and uh, Anderson Dawes comes and he offers him the guy that injured Havelock, his partner. And he reveals to him, he's, he's giving him this. In exchange, he wants to know what happened to Julie Mao. And then he reveals that Julie Mao was with him, was working with him. Yeah. And, and he needs to know what happened to her. And yeah. every that that just... For me, that just it makes it so much more interesting, you know. And it's like, oh shit! And you know, watching this and reliving all this, and I'm like, oh, that's right, Anderson Dawson, and you know. But also, can we? I mean, I mean, we've said it already a few times, but Jared Harris is so goddamn good. I mean, even yeah. if it's an exposition scene or something, how specific he is with his intentions and when to charm and yeah. when to intimidate, when to stand up for something. And then he is the first time he presents his philosophy of what the OPA, what the OPA is and what it stands for and what he, what he wants. And that, that overall philosophy of this dream and vision that he has, um, just good, man. I mean, yeah, no, uh, Jared, there's a reason why Jared works constantly. Um, you know, people are always like, ah, when are you going to have Jared Harris come back? You know, and obviously we've been, we've been very open to the idea of bringing Jared back, at, at, you know, ever since, uh, we had him on in, in the first couple of seasons. Uh, the trick is you get these actors sort of, you catch them at a moment when they're between things and you can, you know, you can write a, a season around them or whatever, but you get an actor like a Jared Harris. And if you don't hit that, that, that magical accidental moment where he's between something, it is so hard to get them on your schedule because, you know, I mean, look at all the stuff Jared has done over the last four years. I mean, he's been in everything. He's been in everything. He, he did that amazing uh, uh, miniseries Chernobyl. Chernobyl. He did that amazing miniseries yeah. Terror. You know, he's now he's working on. Uh, he's over working with Apple TV on the the Foundation series that they're doing. You it, the the problem that you have with the best actors, the the guys who uh, and and the women who can really nail a role like that is everybody knows they're the best actors and they're so hard to hire. Yeah, you know everybody wants them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why we have to, you know, and I'm, I'm going to say this so that you don't feel like I'm bashing you here because 
part of the reason why part of the reason why our core cast, you know, you and Steven and Dom, you know, uh, Shore, the part of the reason we sign you guys to like three or four year contracts is because we know people are going to watch the first couple seasons of the show and they're going to go, those people are really good. We should hire them to be in a bunch of stuff. We got to make sure we're first on the list. We're not going to be able to get our cast back. So then Miller ends up going to Tech Noir which makes me really excited because this is the first time I noticed this. And then when I remember watching it and I don't know if I text you or called you or whatever, I'm like, motherfucker, tech noir. (laughs) Um, One of my all time favorite tech noir movies, but also probably one of my favorite action sequences within a movie is the Terminator. And in the club tech noir, when he sees her for the first time, Sarah Connor for the first time, he goes in there and I mean, how many, and by the way, like if you think about it, if you go back and watch that scene, there's a, a lot of people are dying in that scene. A lot of oh, yeah. it, bystanders are, yeah, well, are dying Arnie's opening scene. up with an Uzi in that crowded, uh, crowded room. It's pretty, pretty violent. Yeah. I didn't remember how dark it was and she, they're running out of the thing and the girl gets shot and falls on her and yeah. Oh my God. And then also, but we, we'll make time for uh, Terminator at the end because once we get there we're not we're not going to be getting we're not coming back yeah we're not coming back so anyway he goes to Tech Noir he asks him uh, you know the sharpie the code word they take him in the back and that guy reminds me you know it, it almost reminds me a little bit in uh, when Decker goes in the back and the guy's in the warm suit the, the guy that wait that's very yeah so the guy that creates the animals the oh okay no you're no uh, you're talking about the the cold room with the uh, the guy who makes eyes yes I, I, I still might, but didn't he, didn't he make a snake? No, those are different guys. There's a different guy who makes the snake. There's, so there's the snake? uh, uh, Abdul Ben Hassan. He okay. makes the snake. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's, look the, at that uh, fucking memory on that. And then, yeah, and then that's there's, why, the, that's why he's here. <laughs> so, so here's the thing about that though, is at least once a day, and you can, you can double check this with my, uh, with my wife, at least once a day, I say to her, I don't know such stuff. I just do eyes. Yeah. Uh, because it's from that where he said where he's asking him, you know, uh, when uh, when um, Rucker Howard's asking him all the questions, and he says, and he just says, "I don't know such stuff. I just do eyes." Yeah, uh, I say that all the time. I'm constantly quoting that line. But yeah. and by the way, one of the great uh, actors, '80s actors of all time. There was an article that came in the L.A. Times. I think he was in over like a hundred and something movies one time. Uh, he was uh, Lopan. Yeah, in one of the greatest, you know. Criterion Classic. I think it's number two or number three in the Criterion Classic movies of all time. Big Trouble in Little China. And uh, um, James Hong. Yeah, James, James Hong. Hong. Yeah, no, James. fantastic actor. And 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 a guy who did a lot of different stuff. I mean, he, obviously, he, there was a lot of movies where he's just sort of played the Chinese guy. But there's a ton of movies where he did uh, stuff other than that. This is a guy with real range. I don't think, I don't think he got as much recognition for the variety of roles he could play as he probably deserved. I was watching, uh, I've been rewatching the first couple of seasons of the West wing mm-hmm. and on, and on that show, he comes and he plays the Chinese ambassador and he's extremely good. He's, he comes across as incredibly intelligent and, and, and manipulative. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously that at that point in, in time, the Chinese American relationship was, was a little tenuous, just a fantastic actor and you're watching him do this in this incredibly nuanced part and you're like oh wait yeah that's right that guy was also a low pan <laughs> yeah. well you know i you know i worked with <clears throat> i worked with james ong uh work with him on. <laughs> i get a call from one of my friends wes who's also wes uh we're um big trouble in little china fanatics that's what we bonded over and uh he actually did a music video. Oh, I've seen this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> with the, and he asked me if I want to play Jack Burton. And I was like, Jack is in the mail. And so, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so yeah, I got to do it. And then James Hong uh, was a part of the production uh, that we did. We, we did this uh, music video and it was so much fun and it was so cool. Like, getting into the folklore and, and, you know, all the learning about the big trouble in little China and uh yeah it was a good time but yeah th- so there's an la you know there's a great la times article on james hong I, I can't remember um it was probably last year or the year before and it talks about all of his work all the movies he's done how he's been under underappreciated yeah. and he's also has a strong uh theater presence in in la 
and uh, they do a lot of theater there and stuff. So guy's just worked. He's uh, just a phenomenal actor and, and uh, it's always fun to see him in it. But anyway, he goes in the back of the shop and he sees the mouse that he's working on and then he puts the puts it together and realizes the mouse in Julie's apartment right. was made by this guy and there's some information inside. He goes in, cracks the mouse open. Now, were you inspired by Blade Runner or what, what, for that idea? Was that idea in the books? Uh, no, it wasn't. And I remember... <clears throat> Uh, that was when we were writing season one, so that was a long time ago. Uh, but I do remember there was a lot of conversation about about what Miller could have spotted when he went into Julie's apartment the first time that would not look like a clue that then he could spot in when he goes to visit Technoir that would make that would remind him so that he could go back. And there was a lot of conversation about it. And I think I think the one who pitched that idea is Robin Veith who was a writer on the first uh, three seasons of the show. Who we have to get on the show, by the way. We have to have her on the show. She's she's so much fun. But uh, I think it was her pitch that maybe Julie has like this mechanical pet and he finds one of those mechanical pets and sees that there's a, a hiding spot in it where you can put things. Uh, if I remember correctly, that was her pitch. Anyway, so she was the one who had that. Uh, if, I'm, if I remember co- correctly, she is the one who had that idea that he would see that there, he would see that there's a place where you can hide a, a chip inside of it, and then he goes back to her apartment. And then old TJ gets kidnapped. Yeah. It's a bag over his head, he gets taken, um, and we don't know who, but uh, he gets kidnapped. And I, I don't remember, I didn't remember that happening. Yeah, that's, well, that's, I mean, that's the classic noir moment, right? Mm-hmm. Where the guy gets on the case he's not supposed to solve, he actually starts solving it. Somebody throws him in a sack, right? That's it's it's a pretty classic uh, story trope, um, but tropes are not always a bad thing, I think. And this is one that I really like that that part of what part of what you know a, a writer friend, a screenwriter friend of mine always talks about. You need a second stage rocket. You need that that middle of the story moment that really launches the second half of the story. And for an investigator who's not supposed to solve a crime, that moment when they get grabbed and threatened, that's that second stage rocket because the threat actually is the encouragement because the threat comes in and say, you better stop solve, trying to solve this crime. And what they hear is, oh, I'm about to solve this crime, right? I'm The, the reason they're threatening me is because I'm close. I'm almost there. I've almost got it figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, a really, it's a really nice story moment. Yeah, and I love the, I love, you know, if there's genres or things that you're in love with, and you have tropes, you have certain things that people kind of rely on. If they're done in a really well way, like get out how they used horror tropes and the yeah. thing, and, and it, but they did it in a way, the whole story and premise is original, but then they, yeah. but they also give homage and respect back to the movies before it. And so you can kind of see it within there. And I, I just love it when, you know, when, when that happens and if it's done well. But now we're back on Rossi, but it wasn't the Rossi yet. We don't it learn this. Until the end, it's the Tachi, right? That's now. right. So they wake up from their big escape. They were uh, sleeping, or at least Holden was sleeping. Uh, Lopez is now dead. He's given his life for to get them out and to get the message out. Um, Alex is in uh, flying the ship, and uh, <laughs> and Amos and Naomi's helping Amos in what looks like the nastiest leg. <laughs> 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 that I think's ever been on camera. And you know what's funny? Uh, and I'm not talking about the wound. I'm talking about the actual leg. And and this is the same thing that uh, Murtry had in uh, season four. Yeah. And, you know, so whenever you're doing, whenever you're creating an inj- injury, it's not just the injury. The whole They're replacing the whole leg. So that, that leg that you see in that scene is not my leg. It's a fake leg. But in order to do that, they literally, you know, they get prosthetic skin and they take a needle and they put in individual leg hairs. And I don't know, I don't know what squirrel is running around uh, Canada that's completely bald because I don't know where they get these the hair to put in there. But it's like the creepiest, like, it's like the hair on the end of spider's legs, you know. <laughs> and then you look at it and you're like, oh, God, what the hell is wrong with Amos? We, we, we used your hair for that. <laughs> That we got we got it from the we got it from the uh, location on my body. <laughs> Did we, you get we got it? it from the the hair trailer. After they gave you a trim, they just gave us all the extra hair. That's what we used. 
Well, then I needed I need to go see a doctor because <laughs> there's something, you know, I might have been uh, I might have went through the uh, uh, the the the, the Goldblum uh, fly uh, thing <laughs> with the fly because it looked like fly. Here. What, what are those called? The the telepod telepods like teleporter. Mean? Yeah, yeah, telepods. I might have went through a telepod with a fly if that's my hair because <laughs> that looks like <laughs> anyway. Because I saw that and I'm like, oh god, what the hell? And then you remember it's a fake leg. Um, and then we get a mysterious message, and it's from Fred Johnson. And Fred Johnson gives us an option to go to Tyco Station. He's going to give us safe harbor. And what is the motivation for Fred wanting to talk to us? Yeah. So uh, if you remember in the in episode four when the the Doniger was fighting with the the mysterious ships. Uh, Fred tells the guys on the ship that they're building, the the big, col- uh, yeah, the big colony ship that they're building. He says, "Turn all the all the telescopes and sensors toward that toward the Doniger. I want to see what's going on out there." Um, the reason that's the reason he knows that the the Tachi's still alive. He's he he was watching the fight with some of the most powerful telescopes in the solar system. He saw the ship leave. He knows that's why he knows where you are and he can reach out to you. He wants to know what's going on because if it turns out that there is a secret, you know, cause the, the, as you, as you mentioned, there's a rumor going around that it's the OPA. They have these, this fleet of ships that just killed the Doniger. If that's true and Fred doesn't know about it, that's a, that's a big problem. If it's not that, and that's the story going around, you could expect a lot of reprisals from Mars against belters if the story gets back to them that the ships that destroyed the Donager were belt ships, that's also a big problem. What Fred needs more than anything else is he needs the real story. He needs to understand what happened out there because there's two versions of that story that are really bad for the belt. And uh, if he can figure out what happened out there, maybe he can head that off. So by inviting you guys to come to where he is, and, and as we'll see in later episodes, one of the things he asks for is you know, statements from everybody, testimony from everybody on what actually happened during that battle so that he has that in his pocket, you know, in case Mars comes after the the OPA and says, you destroyed our ship. He's got all your, your statements about what happened. Um, so that's the reason for him to reach out. And so Fred has this underlying guilt of what he's done uh, to those belters at that time. And then that's why he's going now to protect and work for and serve the belters. Yeah. That's kind of a penance to what he's done. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely him trying to make it right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and, and in this episode we start to see the the Rossi crew starting to form its dynamic uh their their process of voting for every decision that they make. Yeah. Um Holden light lays out the case that you know really Tycho Station is the only chance we got and that's what we need to do and Naomi is completely against that. And yeah. there's some more foreshadowing to Marco and she says within that scene she says I know these people these people with causes and they get people killed. Yeah. And Fred Johnson is one of those guys because I, I was trying to understand why she was hesitant of going there. And so then we vote. Um, and I think Amos agrees with Holden, but he ends up going with Naomi because of the relationship that they have. Yeah. You know, which takes us to that scene with Amos and, and Naomi. And she explains to him why she doesn't want to go there. But I do think <laughs> I do think that's a funny little detail. Uh, you know, she's there. She's ready to get to work. She's ready to get that brain, that big brain to work. But the Rossi's so so smart and so capable of running itself, it pisses her off. <laughs> she ends up taking a panel and, and just and just ripping it a little bit, you know, uh, <laughs> in the scene. That was a that was a nice little detail, nice little thing. But uh, uh, there was a couple of there's a couple of story uh, things there. One is that uh, for somebody who just came off the Canterbury, who like the very first time we meet uh, Amos and Naomi on the Canterbury, they're in an elevator that doesn't work. And she's fixing it by like slamming her elbow into the wall. Um, so to come off a ship where everything is falling apart all the time and then get on this state-of-the-art Martian warship where the ship is basically f- taking care of itself, it's a, it's, a pretty big, it's a pretty big switch for her. And the other thing there is she has grown up hating those people. She's grown up hating the inner planets, the Mars and, and Earth, and they think they're so much better than us. And then to be on this ship... That is like the living embodiment of no, they actually are better than you. <laughs> look how much better <laughs> look how much better their shit is than your shit. Right. That's all of that's happening for her right now. So you know, Fred reaches back out and he says, "Okay, you can board Tycho, but you have to have a new name. You have to have a new signature coming in." 
Yeah. And so this is when we come up with the Rossi. And yeah, you've probably been asked this question a million times before, but what, what made you decide to name it the Rossi? Also, and I remember we talked about it at the time, and I remember because Amos comes in and he says, uh, you know, it, it's workhorse, and it reminds me of a girl uh, that was good to me once. I know that we talk about time, but I don't remember. Is that Lydia? Is he talking about Lydia? No, it's it, because he he paints the the girl who was nice to him on the side of the ship and it doesn't look anything like Lydia. Okay. I always uh, thought that was Lydia. No, uh, she, so, so in, in sort of our, our head canon for that, it was a, uh, a dancer and that that's, that's her picture that he's painting on the ship when he what puts kind of dancing, <laughs> you know, modern tap. Oh, LA. Yeah. He is a sucker for some modern tap. That's he is a sucker. Know about Amos. Yeah, Amos is super He's into it. Awesome modern tap. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was the idea behind that. I, and my feeling, and, and there was a lot of conversation about that very thing in the writer's room with Narain Kip going, well, why, why wouldn't it be Lydia? And my argument always was Amos's relationship with Lydia is maybe the most private thing in his life. Mm-hmm. I don't think he paints Lydia on the side of a ship. I, I think it's too private. Mm-hmm. I think I think he would see that as as a betrayal of the importance of that relationship. But he would get the tattoo though, right? That ta- is the tattoos of Lydia on his chest. In the book, yes. He does yeah. have a tattoo of her on his on his chest over his yeah. heart. But that but that's that's different. Yeah, you know, that's the, different. That makes sense. But I always thought that the heart. tattoo and then that 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 picture on the, the ship was the same thing. So this girl must have been a dynamite dancer to get the I think she and this may have spent some time together. Yeah. yeah. You know, wouldn't it be funny <laughs> if at some point Amos is telling the story and he's like, you know what? It's just easier. He just hold on. And then he puts on some tap shoes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. And I think like, fan favorite. Like, Where the fuck did that come from? Like that movie, White Knights? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that guy just gets off or whatever. So right. Gregory Hines and um, uh, Boris, uh, what was it, Bolishnikov? Yeah, Bolishnikov. Yeah. Bolishnikov. 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 Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Gregory Hines, he can dance his Hines off. His Hines yeah. off. So, uh, Gregory Hines is kind of amazing because he's one of those guys that like, you know, obviously he was a dancer. He was an amazing, amazing dancer. But then he just started doing action movies and he was cool in action movies too. He did yeah. uh, Running Scared with uh, Running Billy Scared Carroll. was fucking awesome. A great action movie, underrated, I, and the Michael McDowell soundtrack yep. is the best. That's a great yeah, movie. A, a great movie. But yeah. anyway, uh, yeah. So, so that was always my feeling on on Lydia, and and so Rasinante, of course, means workhorse in Spanish. Um, the the idea that a and I always pictured the that that dancer as as being very Spanish looking because you know the painting he draws of her, she's very dark haired and dark eyed. The the sense of humor in an exotic Spanish looking dancer, giving her itself an exotic sounding name like Rosinante, which sounds very feminine and, and beautiful. She would know it means old broken down workhorse. I, I, that makes me love that character. We've never seen her. We never will see her. She exists only in uh, Amos's memory, but I love, flashbacks. I love her because she's, she, that there's such a sardonic sense of humor in that name for a dancer I think I love her too. I, I I absolutely understand why she and Amos got very close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I'm in love with her too. I'm gonna have to get the real tattoo of her. And and uh, yeah, you should. And of course, um, that and they're they're taking it from the same place, which is the book Don Quixote, where yeah. you know the the horse's name is Rocinante, and and it's you know it, definitely in the show it's because uh, Holden is very self aware about his chaotic tendencies that he is yes. a guy who who will tilt with windmills and feels like he has to fight giants and sometimes kind of loses loses track of the plot i think he's very self-aware about that yeah and that i he, think that, he, that name is part of it yeah and that that's definitely it's such a smart parallel you know with the name and, and kind of representing holding certain parts of his character but I actually, because I, I, it was such a, you know, it's like one of the first novels and it was, in, and I, I ended up reading it. It's and really long. It's so long. And it, it's, you know, the beginning, it's really great. You get the humor, but then 
you know, after, after a while, I, you know, it, it's like, once you kind of understand the humor of it, it just, uh, what did you think about it? Uh, I read it in, I believe in AP class in high school. Mm -hmm. And all I remember about it is that it was very, very, very long. I think I would, I think I would have a greater appreciation of it if I reread it now. I probably should reread it because um, I think I would appreciate it a lot more. At the time, I found some of the imagery in it incredibly moving, and I found I found the meta story of it of the guy who who desperately wants to be noble, who desperately wants to be a hero, mm -hmm. and tries to build his life around these heroic ideals in a world where that none of that actually works. Uh, you know, the guy, the guy who refuses to let the world dictate its terms to him, mm -hmm. uh, is is a compelling story, and uh, yeah. I, you know I, I love that. I, I loved it too. I mean, all the things you're talking about, the things that I responded like I liked about it as well. But you can also see why a lot of fiction and literature now has stronger form, stronger structure, stronger things that that didn't necessarily have at the time. And I also think it was written in like it was released in installments. And maybe if it was read that way, it might have been more enjoyable as opposed to one sitting down reading of it. Yeah. And then so we find out Kaz and the gang, um, Alex, uh, Amos, find out that, you know, remember the can't is now all over the system. Yeah. And that, and that Holden is now uh, known to everyone. And what I thought was a really smart question that uh, that Alice Kamal asked is like, "Hey, do you?" His first thing is, "Did you tell anybody about us? <laughs> like, did, are our names involved in this?" And right. then when he says no, you see automatic relief from us. And then he comes over and it's like, "Ah, you're famous. You know, see you later." You know that that whole situation. Well, and and then Amos does offer to uh, change his face for him. Yeah, he does often. Do <laughs> if you need to look a little different, let me know. Right. So going back to what I think is so great about the bar, the Technoir bar, and seeing that in there is one of the things I love about the show, all these Easter eggs. But can we talk about Terminator for a little bit? Yeah, well, let me let me tell you one little Easter egg here, one little factoid, because uh, we promised we would be telling people stuff about the show they didn't know. We got yelled at about that by Narain. I mean, not seriously yelled at, like, you know, a Narain level chewing out, which is actually pretty mild compared to most bosses. So it, Dan had put tech noir in his draft of the script kind of as a joke, as like an inside joke. Narain hated it. He would always go, no, I don't want the thing to be called tech noir. It's, it's like, it's so obviously a Terminator thing. I don't want that. And, but Dan just left it in the script, right? <laughs> so what happened was the production company, and this was in season one, so we were everybody was still figuring things out. There was a lot more chaos in the system than there is now. Uh, you know, we're obviously by six seasons into this, we're much better at everything. But in season one, there was still a lot of chaos. There was still a lot of different voices giving orders, and nobody was sure who was who they should be listening to. There was a lot going on. But production got that draft of the script, and they built the little store, and they made a sign that said Tech Noir to put on it. So Noreen is watching dailies and he sees that tech noir sign. He's like, God damn it. I told you I didn't want it to be called tech noir. So, so yeah, we got, we got a little, a little Dan and, and the production. Well, got you know, what's funny. Oh, sneak in the rain. Because when I saw it, I was like, cause I just saw it recently. Obviously when I went, I don't know how I missed that, but anyway, I saw it recently and then I text him. And I was like, fuck yeah, Tech Noir. And I sent him the picture of Tech Noir and he's like, yeah, man, good stuff. <laughs> I was like, you didn't want it to be in there. Okay. okay, but here's the thing is I think I think in retrospect, it's probably much less annoying to him because it it, it was fine. Nobody it didn't become a big deal. Nobody gave us shit about it. And, you know, and, it, and, and the name did fit for the store. So it was fine. When, did people pick up on it when it when it came out? Yeah, some people did. Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, I have a Tech Noir shirt. Uh, Dan Noack and I and Noreen all got Tech Noir shirts. Uh huh. Which where is was I, where was I during that shop shopping? Uh, uh, we that was. I mean, when I we, want a Tech Noir shirt. That was when we were still writing the show. Uh, so Dan found a store online that sells shirts for fictional places. Uh huh. So you know, Tech Noir is a nightclub on Pico. Yeah, on Pico. On Pico. Yeah, right where that's at. On Pico. Yeah, yeah, no, I know it. It's on Pico. Um, <laughs> so Dan went on to that store and he got us all shirts that are for the the bar from Terminator Tech Noir, and it even says on Pico Boulevard. 
So, so I would, I would wear that shirt sometimes to conventions when we're doing signings and stuff. And about half the people that saw it, half the people go, Oh, Hey, tech Noir from Terminator. Awesome. And the other half would go, Oh, Hey, tech Noir from your show. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, I think some people caught it. Yeah. That might be a cool gift to, to give out to people. Like if we do some kind of question thing or whatever on tying that guy or <laughs> shirt. somehow, whatever, like that'd be one of the things that we could send to people uh, for some kind of prize or if we do something on this. But um, when was the first time you saw Terminator? Um, I did not see Terminator at the theater because I remember I, it might have been junior high or high school when it came out, but I remember everybody at school talking about it. Like everybody was like super into Terminator. They, it was like the best movie anyone had ever seen and I didn't see it. Um, I, had, I had like super crazy religious parents mm -hmm. and they were like, oh, it's, it's violent, it's R-rated, you can't see that. And that was just one of the ones I, I didn't just kind of had a point. <laughs> watch it. They're just slaughtering. Them. <laughs> yeah. And, and there was a lot of that kind of movie. I just snuck out and watched anyway. Like when yeah. aliens came out and they were like, you can't see that. I just went and saw it anyway. I, was the, yeah. I wasn't going to let them stop me from seeing aliens. Right. Uh, that one I didn't. And so I think I probably first saw it when it came out on videotape. And I remember that was one of those ones that blew my mind. I was like, it was like this guy, this, this, this may be the greatest director who's ever lived. After I saw Terminator, <laughs> after uh, I was, I was like, I'm, I got to watch every movie this guy ever makes. And it turned out it was James Cameron. So I wasn't, I wasn't wrong. You, you know, like, wrong. like, you know, 14 year old me fell in love with Terminator. I wasn't wrong about the directing. Uh, and that the movie was so far above what it should have been. Imagine that movie with the same budget, the same script, but with a different director. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and you know how you know that? Because they made a million Terminator ripoffs and all of them are terrible. They're all terrible. And then, and how you know it too is if you see the Terminator 2, the sequel is f a fucking amazing. Yep. It's and so every Terminator good. after that has sucked. Yes. Everyone after that, it is never, I, I don't count those. There's, those don't exist. Yeah. If, if, if there's sequels of movies that, that I love or whatever, I just, I, they don't exist. I don't see them. If I'm scrolling through and, and, uh, you know, any of those Terminators come up, it's just, all I see is like blurry parts in the screen where my mind just blocks it out. It doesn't yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. There, there are two alien movies. People claim that there's more than two, but those people are liars. I've heard rumors that there, and there are two, there are two Terminator movies. People claim that there are more than that, but those people are liars. They're QAnon. They're Q, that's QAnon. That's QAnon bullshit. Conspiracy. Yes. Get off of 4chan and <laughs> yeah. read some real news. Read some fake that's, news bullshit. That's some fake news shit. There that's misinformation going around. Yeah, Terminator um, 4. What the fuck is that? Nothing. <laughs> but uh, I remember Arnold in before Terminator. It's we, you know, it's one of those weird things because he did the only thing um, that I remember him from is Pump and Iron. But I didn't see Pump and Iron before Terminator. But he was kind of in the atmosphere. I can't remember if Terminator or Conan came out first. Conan came out first, actually. Conan came out first. I think he was shooting the second Conan when they wanted to shoot Terminator. So I think yeah. James Cameron had to wait to do the Terminator. But so that's obviously that's where I know uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger from, because I just remember being so excited about yeah. the idea of him being in there. Now, it, what's interesting casting for him and, you know, at the 80, in, you know, at that time during the 80s or whatever, they had the hero prototype and you would play that. And if you variated or deviated from that, it could affect your career. You know, it could affect your thing of. And so, right. you know, Arnold wanted to go the route of being the hero, of being a hero. And um, when he sat down with Cameron, he sat down for Kyle Reese to play the lead. Yeah. And when he sat down with him, Cameron didn't think he was right for Reese, but he said he was fascinated by his features and how he looked. And, and then he started imagining him as Terminator. And it made a lot of sense to him because originally... I don't know if you uh, if you've heard this story. Is it Lance Henderson? Yeah, Lance Henriksen. Yeah, Lance Henriksen was his first choice for the Terminator. Yes, Lance, yeah. and and I think that would have been fucking amazing. Well, but, he, did, he he did kind of do it later when he got uh, Robert Patrick right to play. Yes, he did the Robert Patrick in T two because um, they're very similar builds. The yeah. Robert Patrick and and Lance Henriksen, they're they're kind of almost gaunt, right? Very 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 sort of compact and slender. 
So I think I I think he already kind of had that idea of this guy who doesn't look like he should be physically threatening. Yes, that, that that was his point. His point yeah. was is like you know if you create a Terminator, it needs to be an unassuming guy that you wouldn't right. notice because he has that. And so he actually had Lance Hendrickson dress up as the Terminator for his pitch, and he was doing the pitch for the movie. And Lance Hendrickson kicked the door in and came in as Terminator and did this whole thing or whatever. And that, I mean, and, and like the balls of this guy, like this is his first movie and you're meeting with studio heads and you're having some guy kick a door in and dressed <laughs> up as the damn Terminator. But he saw that and he saw Arnold and he realized how visually compelling and interesting it would be. And so he threw out that idea and he said, well, then the Terminator is just going to be super jacked, you know, killing machines like a shark going through the water. Yeah. And so he initially presented the idea to Arnold. Arnold was like, I want to do, you know, heroes. I don't want to take any step backs or anything like that. So we thought about it and he ends up saying yes. And again, too, like at the time, like Arnold, you, you know, well, I, I mean, you did Conan, but, you know, you get this great, you know, opportunity in this movie. Like, what are you thinking? So he ends up in, uh, in, in, in doing Terminator. I, I, but before we do that, I want to tell an interesting story about James Cameron, where he got the idea. So I think he was in South America and he was filming Piranha 2. And this was his first movie that he was getting to direct. Yeah. And it was a really rough experience for him. He ended up getting the movie taken away from him. Yep. Uh, he would break into the editing room at night and edit it the way he wanted to. And he was stuck in South America and he could, didn't have the money to come home. And he ended up getting really, really sick. I don't know if it was food poisoning or the flu, but he was really sick. And it was like a three day in bed, sweating, flus. But he had the dream this terrifying dream of the Terminator coming out of the fire, which which happens at the end of the third act when the Terminator gets the oil tanker blows up and the, the, the actual skeleton. That was his dream and it terrified him. And then he woke up the next day and started feverishly writing and, and he ended up writing the Terminator. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard some parts of that story before. It's, it's fascinating. You know, it, it makes me think one of the people we should have on our show, Christy Stills, our second AD. Oh, yeah. Because... You know, she worked, she was, she was Cameron's favorite second AD for a while. He wanted her on to second on all his movies. She worked on, um, uh, and the one she, though, she has the most stories from is from Titanic. So she was the second AD on Titanic and she has amazing James Cameron stories. And you can tell she has a lot of affection for him because she tells these stories with a smile. And, and it sounds like he really liked her too, because he wanted to keep her as his second on all his movies from then on. But she has some amazing stories about working for Cameron. I yeah, would, we should have, I, and I don't feel comfortable telling her stories for I know, her, I know. But I, mean, I think we should have her on and she can tell some of those stories if she wants to. This has to happen because yeah. I would go to her trailer uh, back before COVID and we can visit people on their trailers. Yeah. She, she worked in the AD trailer and I would go in there and I would sit down and I would say, and I would just start from the beginning and we would just go through every James Cameron story that she had. And yeah. they fantastic and we would definitely have her on the show and i don't want to ruin any of her stories before. No, I, that's why i'm very carefully not telling any of those stories because i would like to have her come on and tell them so i remember the first time i saw terminator it was it was a little bit past i was i was a little bit younger when i was in theaters and it you know it just kind of it wasn't really on my radar and um I, you know I, it was in the the atmosphere and i knew about it but i would go stay with my dad in the summers and his girlfriend at the time was a lady named Linda. And I remember we'd go to her house and she had this cool house. She had a pool. It was, it was really nice. And she had a son. His name was Derek. And me and Derek clicked and we were friends. And my dad never had any rules, any policies about what you can watch, what you can't watch, any of that stuff. So Derek had all these great VHSs and he was like, uh, you know, have you seen Terminator? And I was like, no. And he put that movie in. The VCR, and we watched that movie every day, the whole summer, every day. We, when we got done swimming, yeah. we come back in, put in Terminator, that order of pizza, and watch that movie every day. And I never got tired of it. It was the it, it was the the coolest thing I've ever seen. It was so good. Yeah, I mean, it's I, for me, it's still in probably in my my top twenty movies of all time. And, you know, and I've seen pretty much every movie ever made. So like if you can crack into my top 20, you're you're a fucking classic. Yeah. I love the simple time travel element of the story. They don't overthink it. They don't go through wormholes or time or anything. It's just simple. And I and I feel like James Cameron put in like this fail safe um, when Sarah Connor, Connor was in the uh, in the Jeep and she was driving and it was the voiceover. And she says, you know, if I if I went back and 
you know, if he went back and we didn't with, with, you know, she's trying to figure it out and she goes, it could just make you go crazy to think. Yeah. About it. It's kind of like, don't think about it. Enjoy the story and just shut the fuck up. But, uh, and the, the entrances, and then you got old Billy Paxton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Arnold's walking in his dongs, just a swinging in the moonlight. <laughs> Wash day, nothing clean. <laughs> Wash day, nothing clean. I think this guy's a couple cans short of a six pack. <laughs> and you know what yeah. you see, Bill Paxton, in uh, in these in these like small parts, or in you realize there's something there's there's a charisma and an energy there's something about him that's just so interesting to watch well he, makes, he and Cameron had worked together when they were both on on the production side of it i mean paxton yeah, was set set yeah yeah when when cameron was doing special effects for for roger oh. Corman, at least paxton was building sets for him so they were they were buddies from way back and the, the interesting thing about that is I, I honestly think Bill Paxton went on to become a fantastic actor. Like some of his later work, I mean, for a guy who just got into movies because his buddy started making cheap, low budget sci-fi movies and asked him to play a bit part for that guy to go on and become the actor that he became with, with the career that he had is pretty amazing. I think, I think his weird science is just, just rocking. Chet? I love Chet. 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 You're stewed, but what? <laughs> Two douchebags couldn't get laid in the morgue. <laughs> oh, Chet's amazing. Yeah. How about a nice greasy pork sandwich served in a dirty ass tray. <laughs> For God's sakes, would you cover yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. Now get yourself some. <laughs> did you, what, what's the name of the movie that he did where he, he directed? He may have directed it. The one where he plays the dad who's too. He, he tells his two sons that they're killing demons. Yeah, he directed. Uh, that one. Uh, yeah, frailty, frailty, frailty. Thank you, frailty. Yeah, I fucking loved that movie. That I, is, that's a phenomenal movie. He directed yeah. that. He's a great director. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a good director, but he was so good in that, and it was such a good, well directed movie. I love that movie. I thought that movie was great. He's he's one of those careers where. And I always like reading about these careers because in many ways, that's my career as well, where people just sort of accidentally start doing something and wind up some degree of success at that thing. Um, Cause I'm an accidental writer, but I've had way more success as a writer than anybody has any right to. Right. So, you know, and, and, it, and honestly, I got started writing because a buddy of mine was like, Hey, you want to write a book with me? And it, he, and I look at Bill Paxton and it like, he's, he became a phenomenal actor and director because a buddy of his said, Hey, I'm making a movie. You want to want a bit part in it? And he was like, hey, why not? Right? Like, and then you know, look, 20 years later, he's making fucking frailty, right? And now you're a podcast mogul because a buddy of yours was like, Hey, you want to do a podcast with me? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if we're moguls yet. I, <laughs> oh, let's wait and see if even 10 people listen to this. Dude, we we what we got like what? We we have like 10 or 15 people uh that submitted questions for us. Bro, we're it's we're on our way. We're on our way. You know, but also Bill Paxton had a band. LA, I think it's called LA Gun, I think it was. Uh, and James Cameron directed his music video. And I don't know if that's when they first met and then worked on the Roger Corman thing, or they did the Roger Corman thing and then and then he directed the James Cameron. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I the story I had read is they met working on Roger Corman movies. Right. Right. That but was I know he directed, and you can YouTube the the video, a rock band called Martini Ranch, and James Cameron actually directed um one of his music videos. Yeah, man. You know, and and what I what I love. Well, before we leave Bill Paxton, like the um, one one of, also one of my favorite. He had a small role in it, but he's like makes you want to get on your knees and beg for buttermilk. <laughs> <laughs> and true oh, lies oh, with oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. True lies. <laughs> yeah, true lies. He was so funny. And <laughs> I don't even get laid that often. I got a tiny dick. It's pathetic. <laughs> Yeah. Your career as an international terror international terrorist is well documented. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but is is Chet the one that really that is is weird science the one that really launched him? I don't you know, I don't know. Uh there was a stretch there he was doing a bunch of stuff like that. Weird science was a gigantic hit when it came yeah. out. And so I would guess that that probably because I don't remember much before, before that, but I remember a lot after that. Yeah. You know, and he, I, I don't know, honestly, but I, th that would make sense because it was such a big hit. Yeah. God, I love that. And, you know, I saw him at a bar in Atlanta. Um, 
I was working in Atlanta. There's a lot of productions going on in Atlanta and he was in a bar and I wanted to go say hello to him or have a, you know, he seemed like, obviously seemed like a great guy, but he was in the middle of a conversation with somebody else and I didn't want to interrupt. And, you know, it's so sad that he passed away that, you know, I think back and I'm like, man, I wish I would have took that moment to go say hello to him and tell him how much he meant to me because I fucking, I, I think he's phenomenal. I love him and everything he does. Well, let's, let's, let's bring this back around then. Cause I, this is a question I've always had. And you mentioning that made, made it come up for me as so we're, we're six seasons into the, so let's bring it back to the expanse. Let's go full circle, baby. All right. We're six seasons into the expanse. Now the show is one of those sort of sleeper hits, right? I mean, it, it, you, you get the, you know, it, it doesn't get talked about in the same way that, that other shows at our level get talked about, but then I see the numbers, like I'll see a thing that says like, we're the seventh most watched streaming show on streaming. Mm-hmm. That's huge. We're in the top 10. You know how many streaming shows there are? Uh, like twenty. <laughs> yeah, like like two thousand or so. It's crazy. Yeah. So so we have a lot of fans. Mm-hmm. We, have, we do have a lot of fans, and they tend to be the the kind of fans who love genre stuff. So they tend to be very passionate fans. Mm-hmm. What I'm wondering is, so you wanted to go to Bill Paxton and tell him what he meant to you as a performer. Mm-hmm. I'm, I want to ask you as a performer, when you're like at a convention or something and you run into somebody and they like, you, you're not looking to talk to people. You're not looking, you're, you're not looking for a conversation, but somebody comes up to you and goes, Hey man, I, I, I love you as Amos. I watched you in the expanse. I, I watched you on the unit. I thought the unit was great. I just want you to know what you mean to you know, what you're, you know, your acting is meant to me and it's been important to me and all this stuff. If somebody walks up to you and says the things to you that you were going to say to Bill Paxton as a performer, is that a thing you like? Is that, is that a conversation you like having? Yes. For me, well, for me, because I, I'm a, I'm a social person. Number two, specifically, I don't know what it is about the expanse. Every time somebody comes up to me, no matter where I am or where I go, they're the, the kindest smartest people and we always end up having an interesting conversation what i what i like to do is if somebody comes up i like just to take a minute and talk to them you know yeah. and and, and kind of know their story and kind of uh how they heard about the expanse or whatever so you know there are times like you know if, if i in on, on route or you know in, in a hurry somewhere or whatever I'll, I'll still stop and take a picture or whatever and i'll just say i'm sorry you know we're in a hurry or you know whatever but i always enjoy it it always ends up being a really cool in- interaction and you kind of you kind of get to meet somebody new and have a really great conversation about what's going on. And, you know, again, too, like one of the reasons, uh, one of the inspirations for this podcast and one of the reasons that I uh, wanted to do something like this is because I've been, I enjoy the interaction with them because usually when we start talking about the expanse, it starts branching off and all these other things that we love. Yeah. And I realized like th- th- we have a common fanship amongst all of us. And so I always wanted to create a, a spot where we can all kind of come together. We're going to talk about the expanse, expanse be the foundation, but we can talk about all these other things. So yeah, I've always, uh, I don't, I, I enjoy it. I don't, I don't mind it at all. I, mean, I was just curious because I've been in that situation that you were in mm-hmm. where, you know, I, obviously now I, I'm around more Hollywood types, mm-hmm. uh, various functions and things. And I've been in places where I've seen somebody go, Oh man, I love that performer. I love their work. I would love to just walk over there and say, Hey, I want you to know, you know, that the work you've done has been important to me or whatever. And generally I don't do it. Mm-hmm. And you talking about wanting to do that with Bill Paxton, not doing it made me think of that. But now, at the same time, you're, you are, you are that person now. You're the person yeah. that you might be in a room and somebody walks up and says, Hey, I, I love your work and it's important to me. So I, I was just curious to see what the, now the I will, I will say about. though, I have friends and, and people that I know that don't like it. Yeah. You know, I have them in, I'm a social person and, you know, I, so I enjoy interaction. I enjoy talking, but I have friends that are true introverts and they, you know, they're very guarded with their privacy. They're very guarded and and people will come up and, and then in my mind, I'm like, you just, you know, they, they just wanted to say they like, you know, so you know, I just have a different philosophy than some people, but I do think the worst thing that can happen is there's somebody that you you know, like if I went up to Bill Paxson and, and he was like, you know, not cool. I think that would be devastating. So right. your fear is not that he's going to make you feel bad. Your fear is that he's going to be a dick and he's going to make you like him less. No, no, no. My fear is that I would be bothering him. Ah, my gotcha. fear is that I would go up to say something and my fear is like, I'm trying to have this, you know, deep conversation with a friend of mine and you're interrupting my time. Right, right, right. Um, and then I would feel like, you know, that that would be my fear. And, and also 
but you know, because you know, the, I had that situation with Harrison Ford, and I just froze. Yeah, and then and I think somebody like Harrison Ford on that scale, it's like when you want to tell them how much they mean to, it's like I know, kid, I get it. Uh, you, you, yeah. How old are you? Yeah, yeah, you're around during that age. Yeah, every yeah, okay, I've heard this. Yeah, yeah. when you're like. You were really important to me. He goes, yeah, you and everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm like, I'm like, no, I need the person. I'm, like, I'm the only like one that appreciated Ford. Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, did you see that one? <laughs> I, I'm the only one that 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 got it. Um, but I, you know, going back to Terminator, I love the Kyle Reese protagonist, and that's something we don't see as much anymore. And I'd like to see more. Is that somebody that is like scrappy, wiry, tough, and intelligent? And, and just dedicated to a cause, and that's what makes him persevere, as opposed to seeing all these superhero type, yeah. every, you know, every, no every, vulnerabilities. Well, and everybody now has to be built like Chris Hemsworth to yeah. be a, to be a bleed in a in a movie, and it's ridiculous. Like, yeah, Chris Hemsworth looks great as Thor; he looks fucking amazing. But nobody who doesn't spend four and a half hours a day in a gym looks like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, well, and also, I think that, like you know, like you think about the born identity, like Matt Damon and the born identity. I, I think they can be such a compelling protagonist in an action movie because you don't necessarily, you know, they they they're vulnerable. Yeah, you know, what I'm, you know, you think you Thor w rolls up, and you're like, you know, what what's it, it's like the thing with Superman. You know, like what happens if there's no kryptonite? You're gonna lose. You know, right. you're gonna, you know, there's no weakness or no vulnerability to it. So there's something about Kyle Reese where he's barely hanging on. They're barely staying one step ahead and he's yeah. using every fiber of everything that he has to yeah. be able to survive and stay ahead. And, and when you want you want to see a protagonist push to its limits, you know, it, 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 you don't want him to, to end the movie and be like, well, yeah, he handled it. He's fucking Thor. Of course. You know, you want to see the movie and you're like, this guy is barely hanging on. He might not make it through the next step, but his intelligence, his quickness, his his dedication, his toughness, his resilience, um, I, that is a big part. And, he, and he's up against this immovable object. And I think yeah. the chemistry of that and educating Sarah Linda Hamilton, who's phenomenal, and you know, I just, I love her in this. And then I think the chemistry of that is what makes it such a compelling and interesting movie. Also, they use that horror movie alien type uh, energy coming from the Terminator. I mean, he's a lot like Michael Myers. He's even kind of like dressed like him. Yes, he is. He is the Michael Myers brand of implacable killing machine. Yeah, where and, and one of my favorite lines in the entire movie is is the one where he's talking about how you know, he'll wade through you all. He'll reach down her throat and he'll pull her heart out. That's all he does. It's just that thing of like, I know you think you can win. I know you think there's some version of this where you can get away or you can win and you can't because this thing is a machine that is built for one purpose and it, it will not be stopped. The scene with her roommate, um, listening to the headphones and making a sandwich and uh slider is in <laughs> the other room. Uh, Ross, Rick Rosevich. Rich Rock Rick Rosevich. So Rick yeah. Vosevich is in the room and uh, you know Arnold comes in and he's like, I'm gonna bust you up, man. Yeah, well, like, grabs the lamp and he's like, Don't make me bust you up, man. <laughs> Don't make me bust you up, man. But that's a straight horror scene. That is yeah. a horror scene. The the killer comes in, the boyfriend's confronting him, she can't hear. Rick Rosevich's body gets thrown through the yeah. door, he's just kind of hanging, hanging half yeah. through the door. And uh, and then, but also, it was good casting in Rick Rochevich because you're like this guy, you know. This is when you he's start to see, dude. yeah, he's a big dude. And you're like, this guy can handle himself. He's going to get a few punches in, and the Terminator just just liquidates him. And yeah. Then like, and then it gives you sense, like, oh my god, who is like who? Wh what are they up against? Other scene like that, that where it's it, it's when the Terminator goes into Tech Noir, and that huge bouncer's there. And the girl's like, hey, he didn't pay the cover. And the bouncer goes to grab him and he just grabs his hand and squeezes it. And the bouncer just falls down screaming. It's so casual. It's like he doesn't even look at him. He's just like, I, All right, put your hand on me. I guess with the uh, the Bill Paxton gang, I think that's when you first see him because yeah. he punches a hole to that guy's stomach. So you first see. Yeah. Uh, but this is when you're really learning like, oh, bullets don't hurt him. These things don't hurt him. And how that sequence, the way it's shot, the way that it's written, I mean, that is a storyteller. You got Kyle Reese at the bar. You have well, Linda Hamilton. We still don't know if Kyle Reese is a good guy yet. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, that's the yeah. point is yeah. he's following and, and 
not to mention that great sequence of him getting the pants and getting the shoes and the cops yeah. are chasing through and he's doing all this. And that's how you get to see how smart and resourceful and tough and everything. So when they're in the crowd and they're at the club and they're they're in there hanging out, now you know he's following her. You know somebody's trying to keep the phone book killer is trying to kill him. You don't know who this big guy is. You don't know if they're working together. You know they're both from somewhere that has electricity. Yep. And it, like, you know, the, they get shot with a bolt of lightning and they're butt naked and they're there. He's he's at the bar. And he's scanning the bar and he meets eyes with her and she's sitting and she just called the, she just called the cop and he says, yeah, I know where that's at. It's on Pico. And so she's there. Terminator walks in. She drops something. She bends down as Terminator scans over the table yeah. and then he scans back and then Kyle Reese starts to get suspicious of that guy. And then she pops back up and then he pops to see her and then he pulls out the gun and the red dot on her forehead and and then and then it and then Kyle Reese pulls out a shotgun, wow, wow, starts blasting. He falls down. I mean, it's the, brilliant how it's done. It's just so yeah. good. It's a beautifully directed sequence, uh, and and the music is playing in the background through the whole thing. And they they shift it to make that slow motion kind of they they shift the tone of the music down to the more bassy kind of sound um, with the. So here's here's interesting fun fact about Terminator. So you got me burning which is the song that they're playing in the bar there you uh, it? is recorded by a band named triangles triangles is not a band it's a fake thing it was made up for the movie uh it was uh it was a bunch of studio musicians and a woman uh i can't remember her name but she she was a singer and actress who uh share no no uh it's a blonde lady anyway Streisand? barbara Streisand? no uh anyway so they 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 recorded that song. They they listed the band name as Triangles, and that song and another song are on the Terminator soundtrack. At both both of them listed as the band Triangles. The woman who sang that song went out to fail out of a singing career in Hollywood, and became one of Cinemax's most popular late night Cinemax actresses. So the woman who singing, wow. the woman who's singing, you've got me burning, for, you know, or I'm burning for you or whatever it is that, that song is. Uh, if you watched a lot of Skinamax in the nineties, you saw a lot of her. Okay. So here's the thing. I was sitting here and I was so impressed. I was like, yes. okay. Yeah. He's a uh, uh, Tawny McClure, Tawny McClure. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm so impressed. And I'm like, how did Ty is like an encyclopedia in his head of knowledge of all this. But then as soon as you said she was a Skin and Max actress, I was like, oh, that's how Ty knows the whole story about her. <laughs> yeah, that's not. No, uh, actually, the, the reason I know that is actually because. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. No, I, no I, this is. Oh, no, because a friend of yours is a big oh, Skin and Max um, aficionado. A friend of mine had the Terminator soundtrack cassette tape in the 80s. And we used to listen to that cassette tape. That song, You've Got Me Burning, was always on there. And then a, a bla I think it was about six months ago, I was talking about that movie. And I'm like, you know, I wonder, like, that's like a, such an 80s band. I wonder if they ever did any other songs. So I went on YouTube and looked for You Got Me Burning on YouTube. I found the song. Then I found an actual music video for him. And it listed the band name as Triangles, but it's like Triangles with a Z. So I'm like, Triangles? I've never fucking heard of Triangles. Are they like really bad? So I looked it up and I found a Wikipedia page that is every bit of information about the fake band Triangles, which led me to the Tawny McClure webpage, which is what, like, she was the singer. Did she do other stuff? Which led me to the webpage about her failed singing career, which ends with she became an actress, which led me to the Skinamax thing. So <laughs> I will say, I have never seen any of her movies, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> i can tell the other version of that story yeah of how you discovered her but we don't we, yeah we'll, we'll move on from that <laughs> okay. um is there anything else you want to say about terminator no i think we've said enough about terminator the gun scene was really cool when he goes in there give me the uzi nine millimeter i i i, I literally i i was at a gun store i was buying a uh a a piece, a, a little, a little add on for one of the, the guns I own. And the guy behind the counter seemed like he was about my age. So I asked him if he had the <laughs> plasma rifle in the 40 watt range, hoping that he would get the reference. He didn't get it. He's like, what it was, did he say just what you see here? I, I that, but that's what I was hoping he was going to say. Just what you see on the wall, pal. <laughs> just what you see on the wall, pal. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, um, no, he did not. He did not get the joke. I was really bummed. Yeah. Well, I you would have got the joke if you were working in that store. You would have got it. I would have got the joke, and then I would immediately. Uh, you would have risen in my esteem. <laughs> risen in my esteem from that point. But uh, look, this was a, a fun podcast. Great hanging out with you guys. This was uh, concluding season one, episode five. Uh, and the Terminator. And the Terminator. We'll be back next week with episode six. You have it. You want to tease anything, Ty, from episode six? Any, um, any Easter eggs. I I think we should just keep talking about the Terminator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the reality is. You know, the reality is, is like, I would like to go through Terminator, like, is with a fine tooth comb, like we do the expanse, but you know, we, we only have so much time to do it. So, yeah. And, and as our producer is saying, this is going to be episode seven of the podcast, but only episode six of the show. Um, and the thing I will tease is we have some really great stories about the first time, uh, Wes and Steven and Chad Coleman got together. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, in episode six, there's some really fun stuff there. I'm going to make you tell the story. So come back, come back next week and hear Wes tell uh, what may be the funniest story he's ever told in person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, you know, let us know what you think. Let us know what you enjoy. If you have any specific questions for the episodes uh, coming up um, that we're going to be doing, you know, let us know and we'll try to get to those. And uh, um, we'll be back uh, with episode six. Yeah. See you then.